I wanted to start with Psalm 118, kind of give a hint, a hint of where we're going. Psalm 18, verse 1. The Psalms, as you study the Psalms and understand ancient literature, if you will, the Bible is understood in many ways as a prophetic word of God from Genesis through to Revelation. But also, when you compare literature from one period of time with another, the writings of David stand out as being extraordinary, just utterly amazing, because David appears to have a personal relationship with a deity, and the Psalms just drip with this revelation that David has intimate connection with the Almighty, eternal God, and he has been so graced. And it comes out in the simplicity of this particular verse, Psalm 18, verse 1. And then we're going to jump into uh, John chapter 21 and see how this relationship that David has with the Lord through thick or thin and difficulty, God takes special pleasure in. And David is called a man after God's own heart. And we are also called to be men and women in pursuit of God's heart in any circumstance or difficulty. And David had plenty of them. But Psalm 18, verse 1, read it out loud with me. And you can take these words and make them your own. Take these words in the psalm and say, I'm going to memorize this. And when I go through a difficulty, like David, I'm going to pray this simple little prayer. Psalm 18, verse 1. I love you. O oh Lord, my strength. And then he goes on, gives it a little testimony. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and he is the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am saved from my enemies. And here's his testimony. The cords of death had entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, my cry came before him into his ears. we we'll just stop there. Just an amazing revelation. And it all starts off with, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And we can pray that same prayer. And I believe that it is Jesus' intent to bring Peter into this same love bond. Jesus wants to bring Peter into this place where he can say, I love you, O Lord, my strength, no matter what is going on. I love you, and you are the rock of my salvation. It's after the resurrection. The disciples have not put the pieces of their life together. It starts off with a revelation of the Sea of Galilee. Do you remember the pictures that we took of the Sea of Galilee there? Of course, it's called the Sea of Tiberias here in honoring the Roman emperor, Tiberius. It starts off here in uh, John chapter 21, verse 1. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, that is the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, hey, we'll go with you, good idea. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught absolutely nothing. Sound familiar, <laughs> if you're familiar with the Gospel of Luke, of course. Early in the morning, Jesus stood at the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. A sleepless night, laboring and not catching any fish. A little tired. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you're going to find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, it's a favorite expression of John, 
That's how he referred to himself. He had personally experienced the love of Jesus, and it changed his life forever. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped, he took his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off as a fisherman and jumped into the water. Then the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and, and dragged the net ashore. It was full of very large fish, 153. Amazing details. John is obviously an eyewitness account. Just amazing details in this passage. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have some breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, Lord? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This is how, now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished with their breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, Peter. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the type of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Abba, Father, we humble our hearts before you here this afternoon. Lord, it's such a beautiful day, Lord, and here we are in church waiting upon you. Lord, thank you for the grace of your presence. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the truth contained in it. Thank you for King David. Thank you for Peter. Thank you for these men that you took and used in such extraordinary ways. In Jesus, your precious name, we said amen. Amen. God bless you. There's, uh, most of us have heard of the Beatles. I was, we had a wonderful Mother's Day dinner with a handful of wonderful people. And I asked Teresa, I said, Teresa, give me the four names of the Beatles. And uh, I, I helped you with it. And of course, it's John, Paul, George, and Ringo. How many of you know the four names of the Beatles? Whether you like it or not, you know the names of the four Beatles. But uh, the Beatles were very, very famous in, in many, many regards, just incredible. Michael and I went and saw the, the Deconstructing the Beatles' Rubber Soul, a movie, a documentary. Here we are at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday afternoon seeing a documentary about the Beatles, uh, Michael and I. And how many, there was a record number of people there that day too, right? How many were there there, Michael? Zero. Zero. There were two people there, <laughs> Michael, Helen, and Scott Smith. And we were the only ones nutty enough to go there on a Wednesday afternoon in the middle of the day. But I guess they had better attendance later. It was the first showing. But anyway, the, the Beatles are famous for a lot of things. And some of them are, are not very noteworthy, to be sure. But one of the Beatles' most favorite best-selling songs is a song called All You Need Is Love. All together now. All you need is love. Love, love is all you need. Remember the movie, uh, not the movie, the wedding that we went to? And their motto was, all you need is love. And they took all the Beatles songs with love in it and made that a part of their unique wedding, uh, the couple, you, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it's, But how many of you know that when push came to shove, love was not prominent in the Beatles' reality? 
Cynthia Lennon, how many of you know who Cynthia Lennon is? She's uh, the wife of, first wife of, but Cynthia Lennon wrote a book, and that book had a prelude by Julian Lennon, the, fa- the son of John Lennon. And in it, Julian Lennon says, I owe everything to my mother. My mother, you know as Cynthia Lennon, was the one who saved my life. My mother was there for me when I went through an attempt of suicide. My mother was there when uh, my life was up for grabs. My famous father, famous for a song called All You Need Is Love, was not there for me. It was my mother who helped save my life. It was my mother who laid down her life for me, who lost nights of sleep again and again and again because I was in desperate need and had no clue who I was. I knew who my father was, but I did not know who I was. So it's a point worth underlining, brothers and sisters, that we all, all you need is love. But what kind of love are we talking about? How can we define love? In a wonderful little book called The Bible, 50 Ways It Can Change Your Life is really quite amazing. 50 points in here. That we, How many of you want to hear a 50-point 50 50 point sermon today? taken right from this magazine. I mean, there's some really good stuff in there. Yes. Point number 42, I'll just briefly, it says, love is not selfish. Point number 42, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. The Apostle Paul's words in this verse will likely hit a nerve with people who have found themselves in a one-sided relationship. Some may question whether a truly unselfish relationship is even possible. To commit an... uh, to, to commit to an unselfish relationship is to put the other person's needs ahead of yours. Some recipients will be humbled by such a sacrifice and will work hard not to exploit it. Others, though, will treat it as a license to indulge, an invitation to a power trip. That kind of imbalance is unhealthy and is not what Paul intended If the unselfishness continues to be one-sided in a relationship, repair or re-evaluation must be done. One person devoted to unselfish love eventually will become disillusioned. Two people devoted to unselfish love will create a bond for the ages. What a great statement. Two people devoted to unselfish love will create a bond a bond for the ages. That is the type of a relationship that God wants to have with us. God is out to promote an unselfish, mature love. This is the kind of love that John, the disciple, talks about when he says, God is love. Perfect love casts out all fear. That love that's being spoken of there is a mature, unselfish love. Love that God wants you and I to be participants in. God wants you and I to experience an unselfish love that God is the selfless one who's willing to come and lay his life down for us unselfishly, pouring out his love for us. For God so loved the world, the Gospel of John says. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's a beautiful story. The Gospel of John rings with this reality of love. John, throughout the Gospel of John, calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. What a wonderful way to refer to yourself. He doesn't even say, and John, that disciple who was so close and so intimate. No, he just refers to himself in what we call the third person, the person that Jesus loved. That's his new identity. I am content to be referred to as the one that Jesus loves. And he's in that love bond. It's, it's a love, an unselfish love that is the bond for the ages. And you have to believe when the Beatles were falling apart and they were being decimated, all you need is love wasn't heard anymore. 
Paul McCartney and John Lennon were writing songs to one another and recording them, and they were attacking one another through their songs. John Lennon had a song that he wrote for Paul McCartney, his ex-buddy, saying, How do you sleep at night? It, it, the song was filled with accusation and charge against him. But that was how John and Paul communicated in those days, was writing a song to attack the other person and humiliate them as much as possible. Where's the love, my mother would say. Where is the real love there? But Jesus comes, the resurrected Jesus comes to encourage his disciples in that love. Just look at it with me if you would here. He's well aware uh, that they have not caught any fish. But he calls them friends. He calls out to them in verse uh, 5 there. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? It's a disarming kind of a greeting, and it's where we get the word phileo from, friendship, love. Jesus calls out to them as if they were from the city of Philadelphia. How many of you know what Philadelphia means? The city of brotherly love, right? But he calls out to them and says, friends, you haven't caught any fish, and he's beginning to stir in them the memory of his teaching. The Holy Spirit would come and remind them of the words of Jesus. Turn back to uh, John chapter 15. With Jesus, it's no exaggeration to say it's always about love. With Jesus, it's no exaggeration. Do you preach on anything else? I don't preach on anything else. It's always about Jesus and his sacrificial love. Look at what he says here in John 15, 9, the Gospel of John. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, Jesus' goal, again, is to create a bond of love that will become so unshakable, circumstance or situation or depression or fear or loss will not be able to shake this relationship. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. It drips with an experience of genuine, unconditional love. Now remain in this love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have, uh, excuse me, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, we were experiencing a little bit of joy today in the song, Joy Comes in the Morning. We were experiencing some of the joy of heaven. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. That's a powerful, powerful command. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. See, Jesus is beginning to create that dynamic for Peter. Peter, if you love me, then feed my sheep. In this bond of love, Jesus has a commissioning for Peter. But Jesus' heart of hospitality for his beloved is so important here. Jesus has the ultimate heart of hospitality. How many of you love to have strangers or people over to your house at any point in time? Whose house is ready for us to come over to right now after church and we'll have lunch Whose house is ready? Is ours ready, Dory? No, it's not. I'll tell you, it's not ready. It's definitely not ready. But what does hospitality mean? That your house is in perfect order and everything is vacuumed and all the dishes are done? Or does it mean that the people who are coming in feel welcome and they feel loved? Do any of you care that our house is chaos? None of you care, right? But you would rather be welcomed into a house that is, reminds you of your own house, which ours might remind you of your house. But what, what really matters is hospitality, love. And Jesus is dripping with hospitality wherever he goes. Wherever he goes, it's always about the hospitality of the heart, hospitality for his beloved. So Jesus is out. He comes to encourage his disciples, to be sure. But also, he comes to establish 
his disciples in the bond of love. He wants them to be so established and it it becomes the very root of their existence as a plant, uh, as tulips are coming up and they're rooted in the soil and they're being nourished by the soil and the water. The tulips pop up out of the ground and it's their very, very uh, ingredients of what they are. Jesus wants us to be so established in this bond of love. Establish them in the highest motivation in his kingdom. King David knew it so well in Psalm 18, verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. I just practice saying that and wait till you sense the fire of the Holy Spirit. I love you, O Lord, my strength. I don't have the strength to do what I feel you want me to do, but you are my strength. I love you, O Lord my strength. Just say it with me. Pray it with me. I love you, O Lord, my strength. You empower me. You enable me. I can do nothing by myself, but with you I can do all things. Jesus comes to establish them in the highest motivation in his kingdom, which is to love. And, of course, it goes back to the realities of the Hebrew Bible. It's always Jewish roots. It's always Hebrew Bible. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. This is, of course, you're familiar with it. We've sung it when we've been in synagogues. They love singing this, Jewish people. Shema Israel. This is Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel. This is the command of the Lord. This is God's greatest desire for all of us is to be in this love bond. God makes it a commandment, Old Testament and New Testament. Deuteronomy 6.4, hear, Shema, Israel, hear, listen, let your ears take it in. The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, your hearts. That's the greatest desire of the Lord is to create, to create this love bond for you and I, to make it so strong that circumstance or situation cannot take us out of it. Look at how this works in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It's so important to see how Jesus and the Father have this very, very precious relationship, uh, Mark 1, 11. Here at the baptism of Jesus, Abba speaks to Jesus and says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The father and the son have this beautiful romance, if you will, that is unbreakable and will Take Jesus through the most dark times that we could imagine. Look at Mark 9, 7 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The bond of love between Jesus and the Father. This is what Jesus wants to establish for you and I and all of the disciples of the Lord. Look at uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Of course, this is underlined. We, We know it well. A teacher of the law comes and says, which is the most important teaching of the law? The most important one, Jesus answered in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, is this, Shema Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your, your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these two. All of the law, all of the Old Testament could be summed up in those two realities. To be in that love bond with uh, with the Lord himself, and also to love others out of that overflow. So the Lord comes to encourage his disciples in this love relationship, to establish them in that love bond. It is very core of his teaching, but also to empower 
his disciples. Make them strong because this kind of love will cast out fear. Peter had not yet experienced it. He knew it in his head, but he was growing in it little by little by little. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And when you have recovered, strengthen the others. Look at what it says in John chapter 14. Let's go back to uh, earlier parts of John. Again, Jesus is out to establish in you and myself, in, in all of us, this bond of love. John chapter 14, verse 15 If you love me, the gospel of John is the love book. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask of Abba, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. And here's this beautiful love bond. Again, underlined, verse 23 of John 14. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's hospitality of the home again, hospitality of the heart, this creation of a place of of ultimate home, better than home itself, where it doesn't matter what the place looks like. It's a place where you know you are always loved, where you are always... When we would take our trips back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, and the boys were little, it was always so special because... We would be on the road for several days, and it was uh, 24 hours in the car. So we would be uh, looking for, and it was a long, it was not like hopping on an airplane, and boom, all of a sudden you're, you're home in four hours or so, but it was 24-hour car rides. And when we arrived and pulled up into my parents' driveway, it could be any time of day. We had, oftentimes we had no idea when we were going to drive up. But no matter what, my mother and my father would come out of the door and they would kill us with an embrace, so much so that you thought you were going to lose your breath. My father, who sometimes wasn't always the nicest person, all of a sudden would turn into this lovey-dovey bear and he would just hold on to you. And then my mother would take off her sunglasses and she would just embrace you. And then it was a little bit of a reversal of when it was time to go back home because then the sunglasses would go back on. My mother didn't want us to know that she was crying because we were going back, coming back out east. But there was this love bond between uh, my mom and dad and uh, the boys and Dory and myself. And then Angeline was brought in the picture. There was this beautiful love bond. And every now and then I get this picture of heavenly glory And I see my mom, and I see my dad, and I see my sister, and they're kind of on their tiptoes, and they're peering over, and they're wondering when, when, Lord, how long, oh, Lord, is it going to be before he comes home and we get to hug him? And I I say, Lord, you alone determine the number of my days, you know, when you see those kinds of pictures. But the Lord is out to remove from us any unholy, any unhealthy fears, But one of the greatest fears my sister Sharon had was the fear of death. And the closer that she got to her homecoming, she was dying of multiple myeloma. God was removing from Sharon all fear of death whatsoever. And my brother-in-law, Casey, said, Scott, before your sister died, she was no longer afraid to die. All fear had been removed from her. And I believe that this scripture came to pass in her life And turn there with me if you would. This is what John the disciple was talking about. It's so important. And we can know this today. We don't have to live in fear, brothers and sisters, of dying. It's not what God would want for us. This is one of my favorite scriptures. This is uh, 1 John chapter 4. This is the beloved disciple writing. I've got this freshly underlined in my most recent Bible here, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, and it's the, the you, you know, of course, the word agape. Agape is unconditional love, unconditional, unshakable love. God is unconditional, unshakable love. 
Whoever lives in this love will live in God, and God will live in him. In this way, love is made mature or complete amongst us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. My sister used to say, oh, Scott, Scott, I just wish I could get away from being afraid. Get away from being afraid. And we would pray, Dory and I would pray for her. My brother-in-law, her husband would pray for her. But she was able to reach that place where all fear of death was gone by the grace of God. That we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him, like Jesus. There is no fear in love. Say that with me. There is no fear in love. Just say with me the earlier words, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you, O Lord, my strength. You are removing all fear from me because your love is mature. Your love initiates. Your love is unconditional. And I want that bond of love with you, Lord. Even today, There is no fear in agape love. When you know that God loves you unconditionally, then it's no longer based upon your performance. It's based upon what God has done. Perfect love, this is the mature love of God, perfect love drives out unholy fear. Because unholy fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears has simply not yet been made perfect in love. But Jesus is out to bring about that bond of love with us. We're all on the journey of being perfected in this this powerful love, this beautiful love. Peter himself had to experience this, this journey. Remember how Peter's fear caused him to deny Jesus three times. Turn back to Mark uh, chapter 14. There's a trio of threes here that uh, are just uh, instructional for us. It starts in Mark 14.31. I just discovered this as I was uh, looking at this this week. Jesus was trying to train his disciples, and of course, whatever Jesus sets out to do, he accomplishes. But Jesus was wanting to train his disciples to pray. It was a Jewish tradition of praying three times in the evening hours to receive strength from the Lord. It says in in verse 35 of Mark 14, going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it be possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Abba, Father, Abba, the bond that Jesus had. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, not what I will, but what your, your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the body is so weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Oh, there is the first series of threes that Jesus was wanting to disciple uh, Peter, James, and John in prayer, but they were not yet able to walk in that direction. Uh, uh, This fire of love had not yet been perfected in them. So hence comes the three denials, Mark 14, 72. He began to call down, verse 71 of uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 71. He began to call down curses on himself. He swore to them, I do not know this man. That is the third time he breaks down and he weeps. So hence Jesus has to come And he commissions Peter. How many times does he commission him? Three times. He probes. He sends a probe deep into Peter's heart and says, Peter, do you love me? Jesus happens to use the word agape. And uh, uh, Peter uses the word phileo. And, and, And in John's gospel, they're both interchangeable. 
They're both used in the same way. Brotherly love, phileo, is the same as agape love. They're, they're both so deeply connected. There is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. Friendship love and agape love are mutual interdependent in the Gospel of John. So Jesus says to him, do you love me? Are you in this bond of love? And Peter says, yes, yes. And then Jesus says, okay. The demonstration of that will be feed my sheep. And then he asks him again, do you love me? Peter he uses the word again, agape, and Peter comes back with the word phileo, friendship love, says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says, okay, feed my lambs. Take care of them. Be Not run away this time like you did the last time, but and he probes deeper. And the third time, he goes even deeper and says, Peter, do you love me? And he uses the word phileo. Do you have friendship love for me? Are you willing to lay down your life for me? Remember last time you ran away. You called down curses upon yourself. You did not want to be associated with me. And the probe goes deeper and deeper. And it says it hurt. This time, Lord, it hurts. Peter's pain due to Jesus' probe of his heart caused him pain. If you love me, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Follow me, he says, to death if necessary. Follow me. Let the bond of love be so strong that you will not flee in a time of difficulty. But brothers and sisters, it points to the reality that we are all lovesick people. How many of you know you feel better about life when you know you're loved? We all feel better about tomorrow when we know we are loved, number one, by God and also by some other people. It's nice to be in a love relationship with people, and that's what the church is supposed to be. This is supposed to be, and I think it really is, and that's part of what God is doing, a condemnation-free zone that people can walk in this church and know that they are loved. Know that they are loved beyond any shadow of a doubt. And I believe that's the vision that is right at the core of the church on the North Shore. And our little church family is that we know we're loved. Hospitality reigns here. Hospitality of the heart. Because we are a lovesick people. Bob Dylan had a song years ago called Love Sick. I'm love sick. And I think he might have been talking about the love that the Beatles were talking about. All you need is love. He wasn't talking about the love that takes you to the cross. Are you willing to lay down your life? But Jesus comes to encourage us all in his resurrection. He's alive. Jesus is risen from the dead. And he comes not to condemn, but he comes to establish us in this bond of love because he knows that we are love sick people. He wants to empower us over fear. He wants to encourage us in his resurrection, be established in this bond of unshakable love, but also be so empowered in that love that we overcome fear. When fear comes knocking at our door, but love is willing to sacrifice. Love is willing to sacrifice and pour out. And we're empowered over fear. How many of you would like to walk out of here no more fear the rest of your life? Perfect love casts out all fear. And then, of course, we are commissioned to reach others with this awesome love. Some would say that Peter is the first pope of the church, and I don't even want to enter into that argument. But one thing for sure is that we are all commissioned by the Lord to share this love with people. We are all commissioned. Do you love Jesus? God's going to give you someone to nurture, someone to feed, someone to come alongside of, take care of them perhaps, write a check for them, whatever it might be. God will show you what to do. God will direct you to be pastoral. How many of you know we're all pastors? We're all called to be pastors. And the Lord comes to encourage us in his resurrection, establish us in the love bond, be empowered over fear, be commissioned to reach others with this awesome love and not live in fear. Jesus was telling Peter how he was going to die. And the next time that Peter was going to be tempted to reject Jesus, 
he says, this time, I'm not even worthy of being crucified right side up. I will be crucified upside down. And church history tells us that Peter did not flee in the face of death, but was actually crucified upside down because he felt he was not worthy to be crucified right side up because he had denied him three times. Be that as it may. But the Lord calls us to offer our lives to him. Abba, Father, I thank you for this little group here. Lord, we've experienced such a wonderful outpouring of your grace, of your presence here. Lord, thank you for, the, for these priceless men and women, Jesus. Lord, thank you for every man and woman here. How many of you are lifting your hand right now with me and saying, I want Jesus to purge me, my heart of any fear right now? It could be fear of death. It could be fear of loss. It could be fear of loneliness. You're a lovesick person. You say, I want more. I want more of the infusion of Jesus' love in my heart. Lord, so we just pray that you, you see every hand, you see every heart, and you, you are the one that has hospitality for us, Lord. And you're saying, come to me. Come to me, all of you that are weary or heavy laden or fretful or fearful. Come to me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You will find rest for your souls. Come and drink. I have bountiful provision for you. I have paid the price for all of your mistakes, all of your sins. I have paid the price for your denials. I have paid the price. Come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. As you abide in me, I will abide in you. Oh, Lord, thank you. We bless your name now. We thank you, Jesus. We bless your holy name now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Cast out fear in the name of Jesus. The perfect love, the perfect unconditional love of Jesus drives fear of judgment out of our lives. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death. You set us free of the fear. You set us free, Lord. You pay the price at the cross. If we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. We shall be delivered. We have passed from death to life. No fear in death. No fear in life. Thank you, Jesus.